right, all right, all right. Where are we going to start? We're going to start with a statement from the Secretary General of these United Nations on the United States' decision to re-engage with the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, the Secretary General welcomes the decision of the United States of America to re-engage with the UN Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is the world's leading forum for addressing a full range of human rights challenges. The Council's mechanisms and special procedures are vital tours, tools for ensuring action and accountability. The United Nations looks forward to hearing the crucial voice of the United States across the Council's urgent work. And this morning, the Secretary General briefed member states on the forthcoming UN Climate Change Conference, which is taking place in Glasgow, in Scotland, in the United Kingdom, as you know, next year. Uh, he welcomed the incoming COP president, Alok Sharma, of the United Kingdom, and thanked him and the, thanked the countries who have announced bold new commitments since the Climate Ambition Summit in December. However, he said, the world remains way off target in staying within the 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Agreement. He stressed the need for the global coalition for net zero emissions to grow exponentially. The Secretary General said that by COP26, at the latest, all countries need to come forward with significantly more ambitious, nationally determined contributions. He added that members of the G20 must lead the way. The Secretary General also emphasized that because of the pandemic, preparatory negotiations for COP26 will need to take place virtually. He called for countries' flexibility in this manner. He said the UN will support this process in every way possible to ensure this success. And an update on Ethiopia, where UN agencies today received approval from the government for 25 international staff to move to the Tigray region. This clearance is a first step towards ensuring that aid workers in Tigray can deliver and ramp up the response given the rapidly rising needs in the region. As we told you, there have been a number of recent positive engagements with the government of Ethiopia by senior UN officials, including the Under Secretary General for Safety and Security, uh, Gilles Michaud, the High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, and most recently with the Executive Director of the World Food Program, David Beasley. Mr. Beasley has just wrapped up a trip to Ethiopia, and he, and he says that WFP has accepted the government's request to help authorities and aid partners transport aid into and within Tigray. WFP has also agreed to provide emergency food, for aid to, food aid for up to one million people in Tigray, more in the press release from the World Food Program. And humanitarian workers are looking forward to receiving approval for the remaining 60 NGOs and UN staff who are in Addis Ababa and are ready to deploy to Tigray, as well as for rapid approvals of any additional requests put forward in the period ahead. While we welcome these clearances, we remain deeply concerned about the significant escalation in humanitarian needs in Tigray, where people have endured more than three months of conflict with extremely limited assistance. We're also very concerned by reports of grave violations against civilians, which we continue to receive. We reiterate our call for the full res resumption of free and unconditional access for humanitarian supplies and personnel to the Tigray region, including through blanket clearances for organizations operating in the area so that we can immediately reach all the people in need with all the assistance they urgently require. And the UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths, has begun a two-day visit to Iran. Today, he met with Foreign Minister Javad, Javad Zarif and other Iranian officials. They exchange views on Yemen and how to make progress towards the resumption of the political process. Mr. Zarif and Mr. Griffiths further discussed the urgent need to make progress towards a nationwide ceasefire, the opening of Sana'a Airport, and the easing of restrictions on Hudaydah ports. Mr. Griffiths welcomed the expression of Iran's support towards the UN's efforts to end the conflict in Yemen. The visit is part of the Special Envoy's diplomatic efforts to support a negotiated political solution to the conflict in Yemen that meets the aspirations of the Yemeni people. The Special Envoy's immediate priority is to support agreement between the parties to the conflict on a nationwide ceasefire, urgent humanitarian measures, and the resumption of the political process. As you will have seen over the weekend, we welcome the announcement that the U.S. intends to revoke the designations of the Houthi movement, uh, as they 
or Ansarallah, as they refer to this themselves, as a foreign terrorist organization and specially designated global terrorists. Uh, and I've been asked about to give you an update. Uh, I've been asked by a number of you to, for an update on the situation in Myanmar and our involvement. And I can tell you that the Secretary General continues to follow the situation in Myanmar closely and with grave concern. He and his special envoy have been reaching out to key international actors, including regional leaders, in calling for collective and bilateral action to create conditions for the recent coup in Myanmar to be reversed. We welcome the fact that there are discussions um, for a Human Rights Council special session to be take, take place soon, which will help to keep the momentum following the Security Council's February 2nd discussions. The Secretary General and his special envoy will continue to mobilize the international community, including through engaging members of the Security Council, to carry out calls for a return to democracy, pursuance of dialogue and reconciliation in accordance with the will and interests of the people in Myanmar, and for the immediate release of those detained. We remain in close contact with national actors, including civil society organizations, whose, project, whose protection is paramount. We are concerned at the restrictions on civil society, journalists, and media workers. The Secretary General Special Envoy remains prepared to visit under agreeable conditions to help calm the situation. Her many exchanges over the weekend included a virtual meeting with elected parliamentarians of the ruling National League for Democracy. And on India, you will see we issued a statement yesterday in which the Secretary General said he was deeply saddened by the reported loss of life and, mi and dozens missing following the glacier burst and subsequent flooding in uh, Uttarakhand state. The Secretary General expressed his deep condolences to the families of the victims and the people of government of India. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that at least 170 people are missing and 14 have reportedly died. The UN stands ready to contribute to the ongoing rescue and assistance efforts if requested. And the UN mission in Central African Republic tells us that national, the National Assembly in the CAR has extended the state of emergency for six months on Friday due to security concerns. Over the weekend, the government held a series of events to mark the second anniversary of the signing of the peace agreement in coordination with the UN the African Union, the Economic uh, Community of Central African States, uh, the, guarantor, the guarantors of the uh, peace agreement. The President Faustin Archange Touadera declared the government's commitment to continue the implementation of the agreement and reaffirmed its, its, his readiness for dialogue with the democratic opposition. The special representative of the, of the UN, of the Secretary General, Moncur and Jai, for his part, continues to pursue his good offices and political facilitation to engage with all parties to encourage dialogue and consensus, while the mission continues to maintain a robust posture to protect civilians. And on Friday, the mission and local governments, local authorities, launched a community violence reduction program near Bria in Otkoto Prefecture. 68 weapons, 68 weapons were collected from civilians. And some good news from the Sudan, where we're told that a blockade of key roads to Janaina in West Darfur, uh, which is the regional capital of West Darfur, was lifted yesterday. The lifting of the blockade, which lasted several weeks, will allow humanitarian organizations to scale up assistance to people displaced by the recent violence in West Darfur, both inside and outside Janaina. To date, over 67,000 internally displaced people are in Janaina have received food for one month, as well as water, non-food items, and health services. A rapid needs assessment of three affected villages outside Janaina is planned for tomorrow, with 45,000 people estimated to need assistance. An operational response plan is also being finalized to assist 100,000 people in West Darfur. The plan's priorities include protection, water and sanitation, hygiene, shelter, and education. The UN Sudan's humanitarian front has provided $1.3 million for the response. Overall, humanitarian organizations need $1.9 billion to assist 8.9 million people across the country in 2021. And lastly, an update for what our colleagues are doing in Indonesia to address the pandemic. Led by the resident coordinator, uh, Valérie Julien, the UN team is supporting national efforts to vaccinate 80% 
of Indonesia's population in the next 13 months. That's more than 216 million people. The UN team working to prepare include Indonesia in the COVAX facility. The World Health Organization is supporting the vaccine rollout and has trained more than 23,000 health workers so far. WHO has helped to finalize a vaccine introduction roadmap and technical guidelines. Vaccine safety and surveillance has been strengthened to monitor and respond to any potential risk. More than 780,000 healthcare workers have been safely vaccinated across the country so far. Meanwhile, UNICEF is working with the government to prepare and deploy the vaccine rollout. This includes procuring vaccines through COVAX, as well as strengthening cold chain capacity and financing, among other areas. UNICEF is also working to engage communities on accepting the vaccine and on data and analytics on registration for vaccine and monitoring to those who need it. Mr. Bayes and then Celia. I have two quick follow-ups and then a question. So follow-ups on two of the things that you mentioned. Myanmar, uh, it, there's now, it seems, uh, in various different areas, and it seems to be a rolling thing, they're introducing a curfew 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., and they are banning any gatherings of more than five people. What is the Secretariat, what's the Secretary-General's reaction? Look, I think all those measures are, are concerning, uh, measures that uh, limit people's ability to speak up, to demonstrate uh, freely are concerning. We've also seen reports of um, rolling blackouts of internet network, which I think undermine uh, core democratic uh, principles, and also heighten and the hide the pressure on the private sector because you then have ATMs that don't function, you have transportation that has uh, challenges. Second follow-up uh, is on Yemen. Um, you talked about positive diplomacy mm -hmm. going on, but what reports does the UN have on negative stuff, which is apparently renewed fighting around Marib? Uh, let me just say, I don't have any with me from here. It doesn't mean it's not happening, but let me check. I've not been briefed or given information on that. Okay. So my question is about Somalia. Um, today, well, this year was supposed to be the year that Somalia had one person, one vote elections. Of course, they were decided to get rid of those and do indirect elections instead. Those indirect elections were supposed to happen for Parliament in December and for the President yeah. today. Neither election has happened. Uh, what is the UN's response to that and to the res what is their response to uh, many of the opposition candidates who've come together and now said uh, that they believe that the government is now illegitimate? Look, uh, we believe there's still uh, room and need for a political solution. I think the events that we've seen today, notably what you just referred to, are very concerning uh, to our colleagues in Somalia, the political mission uh, there, um, along with a number of international uh, partners. Um, the UN in Somalia today issued a statement welcoming the recent efforts and progress made by the Somali president and the federal member state leaders to find common ground on the implementation of the uh, September electoral model. Um, we believe it's still uh, it's still possible. Um, we also believe that uh, dialogue among all the parties involved is essential to have a clear and broad agreement on the way forward. Is the government legitimate? You haven't it, answered that. It's, you know, it is not for the United Nations in any setting to uh, anoint a government declared legitimate or not legitimate. There are institutions that are in place, that have been agreed to, that have been negotiated. Uh, we believe that uh, Somali political leaders need to come together to support the institutions, uh, that they have worked so hard uh, to, um, uh, to create, and we still believe there is room for them to find common ground uh, and to re renew uh, uh, support for processes that they'd all agreed to. Uh, Celia and then Philippe. Um, last Friday, some nine or ten Malian soldiers were killed in an attack by jihadists on a Malian army camp in the village of Boni. 
And to carry out this attack, they used an armored vehicle, uh, Yunamid car, meaning that, you know, the, the soldier, the Malian soldier, did not feel unsafe. I did not hear anything about it. There was no uh, press release, nothing. Do you know why? No, I will check. I have not been given anything, but it's a very good question. I will check. Uh, Mr. Hatter, yep. Merci. Uh, two questions. Uh, last Friday, Antonio Gutierrez talked about a new schedule for the withdrawal of mercenary in Libya. What is this new schedule? What is the new date? Or maybe it's secret. And Look. second question on IET. Any comments on the, cri on the crisis? Do you think the president is still legiti le legitimate? Thank you. Uh, well, on, uh, <coughs> on, uh, on Haiti, uh, I will tell you that we're obviously, uh, both the Secretary General and team on the ground, are following the situation uh, with worry and with concern. I think it's very important that all stakeholders uh, address their differences through peaceful means. Uh, we're also seeing the reports and very much aware that the Haitian National Police uh, is investigating 23 people who have been arrested over the weekend for allegedly plotting a coup. We're waiting and interested in seeing what the results of that investigation uh, is. In terms of the term of the president, uh, we're aware of the discussions regarding the presidential term of office. Uh, I think it's worth recalling that President uh, Jovenel Moïse was elected in November 2016, following the annulment of the initial presidential polls in October of the previous year. Uh, he was sworn in on 2017, in February, for a five-year term. Um, on Libya, what I can tell you is that uh, the issues you raised are really that are under discussions with the um, the Libyan parties through the joint, uh, the JMCC. The discussions have been going on. It will be for them to uh, to establish uh, and then to respect uh, any timelines. Yep. We'll clear the room, then we'll go to the screen. This is, a, this is a data from China Central Television. Uh, the question is about Iranian nuclear uh, deal. Mm -hmm. Because yesterday on an aired interview, the US President Joe Biden said that he will not lift economic sanctions against Iran until Iran complies all the terms from the 2015 nuclear deal. However, before that, the Supreme Leader of Iran, actually Khamenei, he said that Iran would only return to compliance if the U.S. first lifted economic sanctions. So it seems like a dead end. Uh, what's the reaction from the Secretary General about this issue? Yeah, I mean, we've seen the, the, the conflicting uh, statements. Um, it's not for us to negotiate on behalf of those parties. What is important for us is that all countries that have been involved in the JCPOA, I think, support the JCPOA. It's, it was a milestone diplomatic achievement. All of the parties have responsibilities under the agreement, including the Iranians, who have to respect uh, the commitments uh, made. But we, we would very much hope uh, that the international community and the, those who signed on to the JCPOA do what they can to support it and, in a sense, revive it. Ray. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Uh, Security Libranken this morning said in a statement that the United Nations Human Rights Council is flawed and uh, needs reforms. Uh, do you uh, agree with this statement as the UN? And also another question. Yesterday, Saudi Arabia said that it intercepted an uh, armed drone launched by Houthi militia. Uh, on your second, uh, I'll check on those uh, reports. We have always firmly condemned any attacks uh, on uh, on Saudi uh, Saudi soil and Saudi uh, Saudi airspace. But we'll check on those reports. Um, you know, we will be the first to admit that uh, any part of the United Nations uh, can always be. Uh, better. But I think uh, any flaws that exist in the Human Rights Council are addressed by active engagement of the member states, um, whether it's the United States or any other country. And I think that's one of the reasons the Secretary General welcomes the call by the secure, by the, the decision by the United States to re-engage 
with the Human Rights Council. Uh, it is better for all member states to be on the inside and to come to agreement to strengthen uh, the Human Rights Council, to strengthen the protection of human rights, which we have seen, especially over the last uh, few years, uh, often take a step backwards uh, throughout the world. Okay, uh, Errol, I see you waving your arms. I assume you have a question or you're just exercising. But I was exercising this morning anyhow, thank you. I got few, but I'm choosing this one not to take uh, time for my colleagues. According to Duke Global Health Center in North Carolina, many people in low-income countries might have to wait until 2023 or 2024 to get their vaccine. I know the Secretary General talked so much about inequality, but what can he do on the ground, actually, with the UN teams, especially in the Western <coughs> Balkans, for example, where all five out of six uh, countries there are uh, waiting, are, are late with the vaccines? Well, I mean, you know, this study from Duke is just yet another study that underscores uh, the risk of a, grow of a yawning gap of vaccine access between the haves and the have-nots. And it is in no one's interest, whether it's on moral grounds, where we think obviously everybody should have a vaccine, but it is not in the enlightened self-interest of the haves uh, to exclude the have-nots from the vaccine. We will all need to be protected in order for all of us to be uh, protected. We, we again call on member states to support the COVAX uh, facility or any other way to get vaccines uh, to poorer countries uh, or least developed or developing or middle income countries. Uh, the UN teams on the ground stand ready to work with governments and uh, to help them access COVAX once they have vaccines uh, to, ha to ensure the distribution and uh, the, the fair distribution and all the support they need. I mean, we, this is what we've been updating you about regularly, just today on Indonesia, on what we're doing. Uh, so we remain uh, the availability of any member state to help them, including in the Western Balkans. Okay, uh, James Rinal, and then, uh, sorry, go ahead. Can I just, yeah, go okay, ahead. Okay, but the COVAX was delayed with their uh, distribution, especially in the Europe, within the Europe and European Union, and the many people, uh, many countries from Western Balkan complained about it. What can you do regarding that? Well, I mean, listen, the the, the European Union uh, and 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 countries who've been associated or working in partnership with the European Union, I think, need to work out the kinks uh, that exist. We are there to to support in any way we can. Uh, James Reinal and then Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. Um, two little questions. First one, um, can you give us an update on um, the new Libya envoy, Jan Kubis, and when he's going to be starting work and taking on his responsibilities? Second question, over the next week, starting tomorrow, there are three space probes from Earth reaching orbit around Mars, one from the US, one from China, and one from the UAE. It's more of a heads up, but is the SG going to make any statement about this? You know, man's quest into the star stars, all that kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, it's all that kind of thing. Um, on your first question, my understanding is that Mr. Kubish started his, uh, his work uh, today, uh, taking over from Stephanie Williams, who I think uh, has been rightly thanked uh, by a number of uh, number of people, including the Secretary General, and many others, for the amazing work uh, that she has done um, on the space probes. Yes, we've we've. You know, I think one key message to underscore is that the exploration of space should be done for peaceful uh, um, for peaceful purposes. Uh, should be done in a way that is cooperative, uh, that is shared, uh, and for the benefit of all people on Earth and whoever may be on Mars. Uh, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. I have two brief questions. Uh, today, uh, or yesterday, I think, uh, Egyptian authorities released journalist Mahmoud Hussein of Al Jazeera after more than four years of detention without being charged with anything. Uh, do you have a statement to that? Uh, well, we, we've seen the reports. We obviously welcome uh, the, the, the release 
uh, from detention, uh, his release from detention, which had been going on for far too long. Um, and I think it's an opportunity to remind people that all over the world, uh, there are journalists who are being detained uh, just because they were doing their job and they need to be released as well. Uh, Iftikhar. Thank you. My, my second Sorry. question. Yes, go my ahead. second question. Sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, on Friday, ICC uh, issued a statement saying that it has full jurisdiction over the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza, and it will uh, uh, consequently uh, start some kind of investigation for Israeli war crimes and crimes against humanity. Two countries re uh, rejected this, uh, U.S. and Israel. Israel qualified this decision as anti-Semitism. Do you agree with this uh, description of the ICC decision? Look, uh, we're very much aware of the ruling uh, issued by the ICC on Friday. As you know, the International Criminal Court uh, and the United Nations and the Secretary are two separate institutions. It's not for us to comment uh, on the ruling uh, made by uh, the ICC, on the decision made by the ICC, as we have separate mandates. Uh, Iftikhar and then Toby. Iftikhar, I can't hear you. I, I cannot hear you. See if we can get your problems fixed. We'll go to Toby in the meantime, and then we'll try to come back to you. If uh, Toby. Hi, thanks very much, Steph, as usual. Uh, my question today, are you able to give us any more color on specific objectives that uh, Martin Griffiths has for his meeting uh, uh, with uh, with the Iranian authorities, and you know what regions is he working on? What uh, is he working on a prisoner release? Uh, any more color would be useful. Thank you. Look, I mean, I think we we've shared in the opening remarks quite a few detail. Uh, this trip had been uh, planned by Mr. Griffiths uh, for some time, um, and I think you know what's important. It comes at a time where the special envoys trying to kind of weave together, to bring together the diplomatic, uh, the more diplomatic, regional, and international support uh, to his efforts uh, to end the war in Yemen. I think we've seen, um, we've seen uh, a few positive developments in the last, uh, in the last few days. Um, and, you know, it's part of, of Martin's uh, mandate to engage uh, not only with international, but obviously regional actors um, in an effort to help bring the, the Yemeni parties together to find a comprehensive, inclusive, and sustainable uh, political uh, deal in Yemen for the sake of the Yemeni people. All right, Iftikhar, let's try you again. And then we'll go back to the room. I can't hear you, Iftikhar. If you want to try to uh, put the question in the chat, I'll try to get to it. In the meantime, I'll ask James to entertain us for a bit. Uh, I have a couple more questions. Um, <clears throat> can I first, um, <coughs> on Twitter, Mr. Lowcock saying that he's planning to leave the United mm -hmm. Nations. What's the Secretary General's reaction? Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I think Secretary General would want to thank Mr. Lowcock, uh, express his uh, gratitude for him, for the outstanding contributions he has made uh, while he held uh, the post of emergency relief coordinator. Um, and I think he held that post in an extremely challenging time where we saw humanitarian assistance become more and more important, uh, needs increase uh, much more. And Mr. Lokok has, has uh, led OCHA through this, <coughs> through this period. We're also thankful that Mr. Lokok has indicated that he'll be able to continue uh, at OCHA until a successor is found to avoid any large uh, leadership gap. How long is the Secretary General hoping that the search for a successor will take? And is the post open to all member states, or will it just go to the UK? I don't have any uh, information on the, uh, on the recruitment process. Uh, but obviously, I think we will try to, find, to uh, find a successor for Mr. Lowcock as quickly as possible. As he's indicated, he wanted to, uh, 
to go and spend time with his family, which we completely understand. But is this a UK post? The I, UK I have held it I, for a long time? I've, I'm not uh, commenting on that. OK. Um, back to Somalia, if I can. Number one, uh, the Security Council to hold an AOB mm -hmm. on the situation now in Somalia. I'm assuming Mr. Swan is likely to brief us. Uh, either Mr. Swan or someone from DPPA. I'll try to find out. Uh, then, given the, 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 the importance of the situation now, as well as briefing the Security Council behind closed doors, could someone brief yep. the journalists on the UN's position? And coming back to what your answer earlier on, because I did ask you very spe specifically if you thought that President Formaggio was legitimate, and you said you couldn't answer, and then you gave quite a detailed no, no, answer I, I, no, on what Haiti I, and, and, no, no, and what the I legitimacy said, of that president. If you look at the Somali Constitution, Article 91, the president of the Federal Republic shall hold office for a term of four years, starting from the day, from the day he takes the oath of office. Well, he took the oath of office exactly four, well, he took office no, I, exactly I, four the, years the, ago. What, what, I, what I'm saying is that the general principle, it is not in the, for the UN to anoint or legitimize uh, leaders. What we're, we're saying is that uh, we think there is, a, a, there is still room for Somali leaders uh, to come together, find a political solution uh, that will preserve the institutions that they've worked so hard to build. And a final question then on Somalia. The group of opposition candidates who mm -hmm. come together saying mm -hmm. that the president yeah. is no longer legitimate have come up with a possible solution. They say there should be the formation of a transitional national council mm -hmm. for this period, for this potential vacuum period until finally they can get a, 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 an election together. What, what is the UN's view on that? Look, it's up to the Somali uh, political leaders to find, to find that, that common ground. But they're hopelessly divided. Well, that's what we're there to help. I mean, that's what we usually do is to try to bring people together. But in the end, um, they have to be nationally led solutions. OK, uh, if the card, uh, let's see if you sent in a, can we hear you now? No, OK, uh, we'll still try. In the meantime, Benno, go ahead. Thank you, Steph. Um, follow up on Stephanie Williams as the biggest developments in uh, Libya were accomplished under her watch, basically. Um, after many men before her didn't manage, does the SG think there should be more female envoys, especially in regions that lack um, protection of women's rights, for example? And does that, is that something that the Secretary General think could enhance uh, negotiations in the future? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, yes to everything you've said. Um, Iftikhar, all right, sorry, we're, I'm sorry we can't get seem to you, Iftikhar. We'll, um, uh, if the question is urgent, you can email it to me. I'll get it for you. Otherwise, um, I will turn it over to Mr. Varma. Thank you, Steph. Can everyone wave at me so I know that you can hear me? 